So today we're going to talk about strategies that we can use to enhance persuasive presentations. I'm going to start with a quick 30 second overview about what persuasion is. Then we're going to look at three common mistakes that I often see students make. And that's issues with source credibility, issues with audience analysis, and then the uh, lacking and openness to discourse. And then I'll end with a suggestion to make it personal. So a quick perspective or overview about persuasion is persuasion is defined as involving some measure of change in attitudes and behaviors. It's a receiver-oriented focus of study, which means that the primary concern is, what is with how receivers both process and are influenced by the persuasive messages that they hear. Because we're attempting to change attitudes or behaviors, what we're concerned about is seeing, well, it, does your persuasive appeal, does your persuasive message actually change someone's attitudes and behaviors? And that means that it's a receiver-oriented focus of study. Now, people are exposed to persuasive messages on a daily basis, and in most cases, receivers reject the persuasive appeal. Think about just today. Have you watched television? Have you seen an ad? Have you been in the car and listened to the radio? full of advertisements? Have you, been, have you driven down the road and seen a billboard? Right? All of those things were bombarded by these persuasive appeals in regards to advertising all the time, and yet um, in most cases we reject those persuasive appeals. Now the three common mistakes that I see students make, and we'll talk about each of these, the first is credibility, and that is just is the, the quality of being trusted and believed in. Is something credible? Is it trustworthy? The second is audience analysis, and that's understanding the importance that an audience has in terms of understanding who is in that audience, who is going to be present, who are you presenting to? Who are you attempting to persuade? If you don't have a clear understanding of who your audience is, you may miss the mark completely because people, different types of audiences are persuaded, can be persuaded in different types of ways. And the last is openness to discord. And I see people often have um, a lack of willingness in terms of engaging in meaningful conversation with people who have different beliefs and different values and opinions than them. And we need to maintain an openness to discourse. So when we talk about credibility in general, we, we think about credibility in two ways. The first is speaker credibility, and that just rev, um, revolves around is the person who's presenting the information, do we view them to be a credible source? And so if you are presenting a speech in which you are knowledgeable, maybe it's about uh, maybe you're presenting a speech on why you should quit smoking and you are a nurse or have been a nurse, then you need to tell us that. And you can say, I've been a nurse for 30 years and I've seen the effects of this because that strengthens your argument and you're going to be viewed as having more credibility towards that source. Now, sometimes we may say, well, I don't have any credibility in regards to the source I'm talking about. Maybe I want to talk about why you shouldn't smoke, but I'm not a nurse. I don't have any inside knowledge um, about the medical industry. Well, what can I do? Well, we've talked about one of the easiest things that you can do to increase your credibility is to dress professionally. The research suggests that when you're professionally dressed, that the audience has a very direct perception, a very quick perception that you're knowledgeable and therefore you're more credible about the topic. The main thing I want to focus on today, though, is source credibility, and that is issues in regards to um, how students pick sources that are not the most credible sources, and then second, how maybe they do have a credible source, but they're not using that source, they're not citing it in a way that increases its credibility and therefore increases the likelihood that that audience is going to be persuaded to have a change in attitudes, beliefs, or values from their original point of view. I like this. What do you mean all my facts are wrong? I copied everything straight off of the internet. Just because it comes off of the internet does not mean it is a credible source. And we're going to talk about that in a minute, specifically in regards to things like Wikipedia. So I created this checklist. I call it the cars checklist. You see this Audi over here flashing its brake lights. I want you, when you are presenting a speech and you're working through your outline and you're looking at your source information, I want you to stop and I want you to ask yourself, these things. I want you to apply this checklist to the sources that you're using. Cars. Um, ask yourself, is it credible? Is your source credible? Is it accurate? Is it reasonable? And is it supported? And we're going to talk about what each of that means. So just a quick overview here. Credible refers to, is the information trustworthy? Does it have the author's credentials? 
Is there any quality control evident? And is it a known or respected authority? We're going to look at this in more detail in the coming slides. Accurate means is it up to date? Is it factual, detailed, comprehensive? And does the purpose of that information reflect the intentions of completeness and accuracy? Is it reasonable? Refers to a source's fair, balanced, objective, and reasoned. There is no conflict of interest. There is an absence of fallacies, an absence of slanted tone. And lastly, supported, the S means is, this, is the source information listed? Is there contact information and in any, uh, any way that we can corroborate, uh, corroborate uh, the claims that are made in a particular article? So let's look at these. So credible. Credible refers to, uh, credible uh, in, in regards to source, we can ask ourselves this question. Is it trustworthy? Is the information logical, well organized, and supported by evidence? And there's a few things that we can ask and look at that may help us gauge the credibility of a source, if something is credible or not. The first is, is there an author listed? And two, is that author's credentials available? If so, what organizations are they affiliated with? Have they posted their biographical information? What has the author supplied us in regards to their contact information? So one, look for sources that both have author, authors listed and then give us some information about that author. A lot of times they'll have that in the beginning or they'll have that in the end or maybe an abstract. They'll say um, Professor Rick Curry is a uh, communications teacher uh, studying the research areas of blah 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 he can be reached at right so they give you some sort of contact information so we won't we want sources that have authors and we want sources that have authors credentials available because it makes those sources more trustworthy versus us just using a website or a source of information that doesn't have an author at all you can see how that would be problematic. If there's information there and there's no author listed, well, there's no way for us to co corroborate the information that's there. If we look at the third question that we can ask, we can ask, uh, is there any source a sort of quality control evident. Quality control refers to, has it been edited or peer reviewed? And that's why maybe you've had a class where a teacher says, you've got to do a research paper, but you've got to use scholarly um, articles. They have to be scholarly sources. Scholarly sources just refers that that information is not published on a website and it's not published in a news article, that instead it is published in an academic journal that has been peer-reviewed. And peer review means there's a whole bunch of people, sometimes it's three, sometimes it's six or seven, and when information is submitted to that, uh, that journal for, for publication, there is an editor who looks at it and sends that out to everyone else who is on that editor editorial review board. They all look over it, and in order for that information to pass, so many of, say, if there's five, maybe four of the five have to agree that that is information uh, that should be pu published in the journal. Then they're going to send it back to the author, going to say, yes, we would like to publish this work for you. However, we want you to make the following changes before you do so. And then the author is going to make some changes, and then they send it back, and then eventually it gets published. It can be a very lengthy process, like years, to get something published. It's not uncommon for it to take a year and a year and a half from the time that you submit a, a, a manuscript uh, for publication for it to actually show up. And so you can see that if you're pulling sources from scholarly journals and scholarly, um, scholarly type of articles and sources, that they are much, much, much more credible because there's going to be author's information all of the credentials are going to be there. It's going to have the backing of the journal. And then lastly, there is going to be uh, quality control uh, in place. That has been peer reviewed. Uh, so much different than, say, getting information from a source uh, like Wikipedia. Is it a well-known or respected authority, right? Oftentimes we can look at this. Uh, we can look at the URL. If it's a website, if it's a .gov, it means it's a government website, government agency. Generally, those are going to be viewed as more credible than if we just pull random information uh, from a website. Let's look at this clip from The Office. Wikipedia is the best thing ever. Anyone in the world can write anything they want about any subject. So you know you are getting the best possible information. 
Right, so I think that clip highlights the fact why we don't want to use Wikipedia, right? As he says, it's the best thing in the world. Anybody can access it. Anybody can put that information there. There is no peer review. We don't know who those people are. And as a result of that, it's not viewed as a credible source, and you want to avoid it at all costs. The A stands for accurate, and that refers to the correctness, the truthfulness, and overall presentation of material. So we can ask ourselves a few questions that can help us uh, determine if a source is accurate. The first is, is the information dated? For instance, I do a lot of communication research, and so communication research, if I'm pulling something and using something from 1964, versus something that I'm pulling from 2012 and even 2017 or 2018 now, that source information is going to be so varied based off of that time. And so if you are talking about a source or if you are talking about a topic that is time sensitive, then you want to make sure that you're pulling information, that you're pulling sources that are current. I wouldn't want to talk about communication research and use articles from 1964 if I'm doing current research. It, my sources are not going to be viewed as credible, and it's not going to be published anywhere because people, people are going to come back and say, it's, it's dated. Your research is so dated. It's, it's annotated. So antiquated. Uh, if we can also ask ourselves, is it free from errors, both in content and, and in spelling and grammar? If you're looking at a source and that source has a lot of spelling mistakes and a lot of grammar mistakes, that should be your first cue right there, that it is not a credible source and you should just disregard that information altogether. If you're pulling source from a website, Oftentimes we can look at just the website's appearance. Is it a professional appearing website? Does it appear to have someone behind the scenes who's doing a nice job to make that, pre that information be presented in a nice way? Or does it look like something that was just casually thrown up on the web or has time and care going into the presentation of it? So that can help us answer that question of accuracy. It's whoever, not whomever. No, whomever is never actually right. No, sometimes it's right. Michael is right. It's a made-up word used to trick students. No, actually, whomever is the formal version of the word. Obviously, it's a real word, but I don't know when to use it correctly. Right. Perfect example there. Whomever or whoever. Who cares, really? But what that refers to is the accuracy of information. Is the information accurate? Is it easily accessible? Uh, and whatnot. If we move on to the reasonable, reasonable refers to something being fair, balanced, objective, um, absence of conflict of interest, absence of having a slanted tone. So ask yourself, what are the author or the producer's goals and intentions? Are they trying to sell you something? If you're, if you're reading a web page about um, a new cosmetic line and they're at the bottom they say, buy this now, well, and they provide you the opportunity to buy it, it's probably going to be slanted. And that's why, as consumers, oftentimes we pay attention to that and we discount people's opinions um, if, if they have been provided a sample. So, for instance, on Amazon, I buy a lot of stuff from Amazon and I'll go through and I'll read product reviews. And down at the bottom of some of the product view, reviews, in the very last line it'll say, and I was given a free sample of this product or I did receive this product free of charge um, in, um, in exchange for my honest review. Well if you give me a free MacBook or a free Apple Watch I could hate it but if you give it to me for free and all I have to do is write a review I'm probably going to write you a positive review. So I'll try to stay away from those uh, type of product reviews because they're just not as trustworthy. And right, and so you can see that you can you can apply that here to this concept of reasonability, um, as it affects our perception of something being credible or not. Right? Does the information consist mainly of facts, or is someone stating their opinion? If it's someone's opinion, it's going to be viewed less credible than if it is actual stated verifiable facts. Is the author upfront about stating any affiliations of importance? Right? If you, if they're talking about um, how there is no need for gun control and they are the chairman of the local gun association and they don't tell you that 
well, that probably is going to impact their ability to be fair and reasoned in regards to that. So we need to look for those affiliations if those affiliations are present. And lastly is the information, if it does contain an argument opinion, do they at least present to you both sides of the argument, right? So do they present to, uh, with you opinions recognized and addressed from both sides of the issue? And if so, that's going to be a far more balanced and a far more reasoned uh, source, and therefore the credibility of that source is going to be increased. Think about this in terms of conflict and interest and fair, objective, and reasoned. Think about it. If you look at CNN, CNN is generally viewed as being a neutral news network. Whereas if you look at MSNBC and Fox News, they are slanted in their opinions on opposite ends of the spectrum. CNN generally falls somewhere in between. Fair and balanced. I think that might have been their slogan at one point. Right? So you can look at news sources, and just because something is coming from a news source does not mean that it's credible, and it does not mean that it is fair or balanced. And so we need to be aware of that in how we choose our sources. As we move on to the last, which is the S, meaning is it supported, we can ask ourselves, is that source information, does it have contact information in any way to corroborate its claims? Does it reference other sources? If it's a website, does it contain appropriate links to other information? Is it consistent with that other information? Meaning if 16, if you've researched 15 articles, and 14 articles say something is one particular way, and then you find one article that says something completely different, that should be a red flag. You should stop and pause and say, you know what, this might need a little bit more corroboration. Everything else I've read has said one thing, and now all of a sudden I'm reading this one article that says something else. This might not be a credible source. And so you need to be able to recognize that and then um, and then remove that information if it is indeed problematic. So again, just in uh, briefly here, is ask yourself, is your source credible? Is your source accurate? Is it reasonable? And is it supported? Now, for instance, oh, let's talk about how you can now implement this in your speeches. So instead of saying, I read an article that said 75% of people who smoke three cigarettes a day would die on average seven years sooner than a non-smoker, right, if you're giving a speech about the detrimental effects of cigarette smoking, well, that's a weak credibility there to your argument. And you also provided no oral citation, which in effect is plagiarism. So you've done a lot of bad stuff there if... And unfortunately, students do this a lot. They say things like this, and it's just not credible. So instead of saying that, right, an example, a poor example, I want you to ask yourself this in regards to your sources, and you can apply this in terms of an oral citation. Who? Who says it? Who is saying it? What are they saying? How did they say it? When did they say it? Where did they say it? And why does it matter? Or why should you care? So let's think about it again. You've got information. You've got a source. Something that you want to use. And you say, this is great This is great stuff. It's past the CARS checklist. And now you want to use that source in your speech. How are we going to orally cite it? You're going to do it by asking yourself, answering the question, who said it? What did they say? How did they say it? When did they say it? Where did they say it? Why is it important? Now let's apply that to the same bad example that we just used and try again. A 2017 article published in the Journal of American Heart Health by Dr. Daniel Hahn, a leading researcher in heart disease at St. John Hopkins University, found people who smoke three cigarettes a day are 75% more likely to suffer from heart disease than non-smokers. Now, this research study was important because it confirmed results found in three similar studies conducted over the last 15 years. So you see there that we've answered that question. If we go back here, instead of saying, I read an article that said 75% of people who smoke three cigarettes a, a day would die on average seven years sooner, you're saying the same thing, but you're saying it in a much more credible way, answering the question of who said it, what did they say, how did they say it? When did they say it? Where did they say it and why? So the 2017 article, that would be when they said it, published in the, American, in the Journal of American Heart Health. 
So that's where they said it. A leading research um, published by Dr. Daniel Hahn, that's who said it. A leading researcher in heart disease at St. John Hopkins University, that leads to the credibility, found people who smoke three cigarettes a day are 75% more likely to suffer from heart disease. Why is it important? Well, it's important because this research study confirmed results found in three similar studies. So reciprocity, it's saying this has been replicated. So you can see there how you can take that source information and use that chart to orally cite your sources in a way that in, impacts and increases the source credibility. Now audience understanding is understanding that there are multiple components that make up your audience. The first is demographic analysis. That involves the age, gender, culture, ethnicity, race, religion, educational level of the people present in your audience. Attitudinal analysis says that we attempt to understand the likely beliefs that they may hold, their attitudes and the values of those present in the audience. If you're speaking to a room full of senior citizens um, about social topics, their attitudinal analysis is going to be important because they're likely to have very different beliefs than if you're talking to a room full of millennials and college students. An environmental analysis just says that we take into effect seating arrangement, audience size, room layout, etc. Now for you, because you're giving your speeches in an online capacity in all likelihood, um, then this is less important because your audience may be people that you know or they may be present in a safer space instead of you presenting in an auditorium in front of strangers. So these things do matter. Ethnocentrism is what you want to avoid, and that is the idea or belief that your way of seeing things is not only the best way, but the only way. So that your beliefs, your attitudes, and your values are not the only way that people can experience or react to a certain topic. And so you need to approach your topic from that understanding and say, you know what, I, I'm, I'm going to approach this from a, a more open mind. So having that openness to discourse. If not, you're going to run into this. This is not an actual problem with the presentation. It is just a reminder that people will stop you. People will, you will lose all credibility, and they will not even follow along and listen to your presentation if they don't view you as being credible, if they don't view you as being open-minded and open in regards to it. So you have the ability to decide how you approach your audience, and if you're going to maintain an openness to discourse. I've asked you to watch The Weekday Vegetarian. You've posted your comments, and you've discussed that, where he presents this idea to the audience that, okay, well, I am not understanding the audience in a way that says, I am not going to, to be able to persuade them to give up meat, to become vegetarian in its entirety. It's just not possible. So what can I do? How can I affect change in their attitudes and their behaviors and their beliefs? And he suggests becoming a weekday veg vegetarian where you only eat meat on the weekends. You eat meat, whatever you want on the weekends, but during the week you're going to be a vegetarian, almost as a compromise. So if you're talking about a sensitive topic or a topic that may be difficult to persuade people, look for this middle ground. Look for the opportunity to provide people with an alternative or a halfway point where they can still adopt a change in attitudes, beliefs, or behaviors, but where you're not challenging them to give up something entirely or to completely change their belief or value system. If you provide people that, uh, the ability to do that, you're much, much more likely to actually change, uh, to affect a change in persuasion. Now, our openness to discourse is, is filtered because we filter it. We only expose ourselves to the videos that we like, the brands that we like, the facts that we like, the opinions of people that we like, and the news sources that we like. And we filter everything else out. And that's, that's important to understand when you are attempting to affect change in, in beliefs and values in people because you're probably going to be outside that bubble. You're going to have a belief or a thought or something outside of our filter feed and we're not normally exposing ourselves to that. So be prepared to be challenged and be prepared for people to stop and say, yeah, no, I, this is not affecting me at all. Lastly, as we close with a statement, I wanna, I wanna say you can make it personal. And that is that if you understand the needs 
and interest of the audience. And you actively involve the audience in that process. You can connect their life experiences with the new information. So if you can show them how their life can be better if they change something, if they adopt a new value system or a new belief or a change in behavior or attitudes, if you can show them the benefit that they will have in their own life, then you're much more likely to, to affect change. And so you need to make that information relevant to their lives and their busy to their needs and their busy lives. So think, how can I help them solve a problem? Let me let me point, let me direct them, direct this information to them as if this is a problem. Show them what the problem is, why they need to change, and let me help them get there. Right? I like this chart here. What you say and what they're interested in, and there is very little relevance. In between somewhere in between you have to capture their attention you have to understand who the audience is and you have to have credible trustworthy information otherwise it's just not going to work and in closing I like this previously to gain someone's attention you could lightly tap them on the shoulder but now you have to hit them full force with a sledgehammer right used to you could say well smoking is going to impact your life or drinking and driving is going to impact your life in a negative way and people would listen. Now they see that commercial or see that ad, they don't think twice. The New York um, Ad Council actually has some very good ads, and they are hitting them full force, full force with a sledgehammer. And I want you to watch this ad with me. My dad is bringing home the best birthday cake ever. Should have been here a half hour ago. Daddy! Mom? That was the day a drunk driver killed my dad. This is how I celebrate my birthday now. Impaired drivers take lives. Think. Now that is an impactful. That is a sledgehammer full across you. That will get your attention. So look for those opportunities and understand that you have to sometimes hit people hard, you have to be graphic, you have to use images and imagery, you have to hit them emotionally in order for them to sometimes even stop and listen to what you're having to say or to have that lasting impact like that video just had in regards to drinking and driving. So in closing, ask yourself for every source that you use, these things, does it match the car's checklist? Is it credible? Is it accurate? Is it reasonable and is it supported? And then if it is, then include it in your speech. And when you include it in your speech, we need an oral citation of that information. So it's not just good enough to say, well, seven of 10, blah, blah, blah. You need to tell us you can answer these questions. Who said it? What did they say? How did they say it? When did they say it? Where was it? And why is it important for us? If you implement that into your source information and source credibility, you're likely to have a much, much more persuasive presentation.